Reaching our furthest point north in our trip across Scotland, we stopped at our ultimate destination. In 2016, we'd missed seeing this storied mansion and vowed to make it there this time around. Sitting forgotten, the mansion was once a castle that was host to famous visitors, a dark legacy, and a truly shocking event that echoes still today in local legend. The land it sits upon was once known as Eileen Duv, or Black Island, so named for its association with witchcraft, black magic, and its dark forests. Today we explore the remains and a story of an abandoned mansion's family curse and human sacrifice. The famous and long-reigning King William the Lion in 1179 built a small castle here called Edder Dover to consolidate lands he'd recently gained after years of fighting against local rebel chiefs led by Donald Bain MacWilliam, a claimant to the throne who was eventually killed in 1187. By the date of the castle's eventual abandonment, many centuries later, it would be the longest continuously occupied building in Scotland. The original structure was most likely a small fortalice or fortified tower house. At first it was owned by William's brother David, the Earl of Huntingdon, and later, by 1230, the castle was lived in by Sir John de Bisset, who died airless, passing the castle in 1278 to Sir Andrew de Besco, who was slain. By 1427, the Earl of Ormond of the Black Douglas clan owned the lands. In 1455, the crown seized them from the Earl after the Battle of Arkenholm, where he was defeated and executed. The castle was then nominally to fall under the rule of the nearby Mackenzie clan, who in 1488 fought in the Battle of Sauchyburn. Here, Hector Roy Mackenzie was defeated while supporting King James III, who died in the combat when he was thrown from his horse. The rebel faction, emerging victorious, was led by King James III's own son, James the Duke of Rothesay. Instead of surrendering to the rebels, Hector struck out at Clan Rose who held the castle for them and seized it and left a garrison there. James, then crowned as King James IV, reached out to Hector who submitted to him. For his loyalty to James III, he was granted many lands and estates including stewardship of the castle, as well as Brahan Castle, Eileen Donan Castle, and others. This increased the clan's fortunes, which had already risen as they had profited off the fall of the MacDonald clan. The fall of the MacDonalds had begun in 1462 when John MacDonald II, the Lord of the Isles, signed a treaty with Edward IV of England to conquer Scotland. In 1493, King James IV found out about the plan and stripped John of his titles and lands. Much of the lands of the MacDonald's Earldom of Ross was then awarded to the Mackenzies. In 1491, Hector's brother Kenneth, then the clan chief and the new owner of the castle, led the Mackenzies to victory over the MacDonald clan at the Battle of Park, but he died shortly after in 1492. In 1562, Mary Queen of Scots was to visit the castle briefly while the Mackenzies helped her retake Inverness Castle. Shortly afterwards, in 1570, the castle was formally granted to the clan and Kenneth Mackenzie, the tenth chief by the throne. His son, Roderick Mackenzie, a well-known warrior who often fought the Macdonalds, was born at the clan stronghold at Brahan Castle and obtained a further charter for baron of the castle in 1608. The Mackenzies would keep gaining power with Kenneth the twelfth chief made Lord Kintail in 1609. His son, Colin, was made the Earl of Seaforth in 1623. In 1641, the current building was constructed by his descendant, Chief Rory Mackenzie, and likely incorporated at least the foundations of the original castle. This building was an L-shape pictured here. The central part was a hall with a private room with a balustrade top tower with stairs that led to a private bedroom. On the east end was another square tower, and on the west end were two end turrets with corbeling and thick walls suggesting an earlier 25 by 40 foot tower house. The walls on this side were six feet thick and seemed to include the original foundations. On that side was also the buttressing from the early castle and a drop to a stream and marshy ground. In 1649, Chief Rory Mackenzie allied with James Graham, Marquess of Montrose, who fought on the side of deposed King Charles I. Montrose was supposedly camped at the castle when news came of the execution of Charles I by the rebels led by Cromwell. After Montrose's defeat, the castle was the last to fall in Scotland, being burned and looted in 1649, just eight years after its building. It was during the years following the burning that a disturbing legend of the mansion was to arise, being recounted in 1899 by Alexander Mackenzie, a folklorist. Sometime in the late 1600s, a strange disease, much like Mad Cow, was killing off the cattle in the surrounding lands after making them go crazy. The lord of the castle, 
Kenneth Mackenzie, the fourth Earl of Seaforth and the Mackenzie Lord of Kilcoy Castle, offered a large sum of money to anyone who could cure the malady. They were approached by an old warlock. The wizard, in return for his services, demanded a human sacrifice. The Mackenzie Lords agreed to this horrible pact, and the record state. A large barn was for its secluded position selected at a suitable place for the hard crime, where a poor, friendless man who lived in Linwood, close to the site of the present Free Church Manse, was requested, under some pretense, to appear on a certain day. The unsuspecting creature obeyed the summons of his superiors. He was instantly bound and disemboweled alive by the horrid wizard, who dried his heart, liver, pancreas, and reduced them to powder of which he ordered a little to be given to the diseased animals and water. Close to death, the victim is said to have uttered his last words. Translated from Gallic, they read, Let the day never come when the family of the castle shall be without a female idiot, or the family of Kilcoy without a fool. In our recent research, I believe I have found the sacrificial barn, and we will return to explore it in the future. Over the following years and centuries, the predictions of the dying sacrifice man would play out against the Mackenzie lords of the castle and their Kilcoy castle relatives. We will return to the tale of this curse and its outcome later, after we explore the mansion. In 1745, the castle again supported the deposed Stuart dynasty kings and hosted Bonnie Prince Charlie during the rebellion. In 1790, the Mackenzies in great debt would sell the castle to James Grant, who renovated it and whose family member Patrick resold it for great profit in 1828 to a Sir William Fetz, founder of Fetz College, who died just eight years later. Finally, the property became owned by Colonel Hugh Bailey starting in 1838. The Bailey family were descendants of Scottish King John Balliol. However, they fled the country in the 1400s after the three young Balliol brothers murdered their tutor. They returned supporting King James II and Alexander I Earl of Huntley in battle, and from then on were granted lordships of Dock Four and other estates they lived upon. The colonel was wealthy, being a partner at Bristol Old Bank and having 20 plantations in Guiana and the West Indies. Colonel Hugh, once settled in, had the castle converted into a fashionable baronial mansion in 1840 by the famous architect William Byrne, who is credited with starting the Scottish baronial revival movement. You may remember we visited previously this massive mansion he also designed. Byrne added a new tower in front of the middle stair tower, a pillared loggia in the front, a round tower on the northeast, and servant buildings in the back. The colonel died in 1866, and his son Henry Bailey, a member of parliament for Inverness, inherited. He was a close friend of Prime Minister Benjamin Disraeli, was Under Secretary of State for India, and was considered a cold man. He outlived his three sons, and the castle and lands passed to his relative, Colonel James Bailey. James was to marry into great wealth in 1894, taking the hand of Nellie Lisa, daughter of the famous Michael Bass, first Baron Burton. Baron Burton had made Bass Beer the largest brewing company in the world, and it still operates today. On her father's death, Nellie would become the second Baroness Burton and remain at the castle as a widow after Colonel James' death in 1931, until the army requisitioned the mansion in World War II to house troops. During this time, her son, Colonel George, died in the conflict. The mansion was returned after the war in poor shape and was briefly rented out. By the 1950s, it was in decline, suffering dry rot and was mostly stripped of the furnishings and the metal from its roof to avoid taxes. Nellie died in 1962 and the mansion sits dark and empty. Instead of heading in the front, we're first headed to the back, near the river, which is the oldest part of the mansion. This tower appears to have thicker walls and is built upon the thick base of the old 1100s castle. We enter through a window into a side passage that leads to the smaller stairwell tower.
You can still see the green wood trim on the doorways. While the stair landing still holds, the stair is partly gone, and the way down is a slope of broken steps with a door laying on it and a rusted hand railing. Overall, it's a bit of a death trap. The large room here looks to have been a main feature, possibly a living room or the greeting room with three levels in total showing yellow paint and green trim. Further down a hallway are vaulted ceilings and thick walls, which historians believe could be from the 1641 building or the even earlier tower. This small vaulted room to the right still has green baseboards. The hall ends at a room with a fireplace. The ceiling in front of it has recently had a cave in, dropping large rocks from above and leaving a cavern.
I'm a bit fascinated by this hole in the ceiling as it shows upper floors with plastered walls. Past the chamber is a section that shows signs of fire, possibly exposed burned areas once hidden from the torching in 1649. A wood stairwell still exists. Luckily I can tell it ends after it turns the corner as the railing hangs above us and the landing is rotten away. Strangely, if you look further up, the steps become stone on the second floor. This small room has door frames, but also remaining shelves. An even smaller, narrow room with shelves along the walls lies beyond. The vaulted chamber here has a half-buried fireplace. The ceiling has caved in so much that it's only held up by a few stones. We head outside, our exploration ending, but there's more to the story of this house, and it only gets darker and stranger the deeper you fall into its lost tale. You might ask, what became of the Mackenzie family of the castle, who were forced to sell it in 1790 due to their great debts? Many say the curse uttered by the sacrificed friendless man they led to his doom has in fact already come to pass. The castle was to fall into ruin, and their other great houses too were to crumble, and their family line and titles were to fail. More surprising than the curse of the dying man is the fact an even more famous curse upon the family by a man known as Conic Hour, meaning Kenneth the Sallow, was said to have been made a generation before, and also itself to have predicted the later curse being laid. Conic, over time, would come to work at Brahan Castle for Kenneth Mackenzie, the third Earl of Seaforth, the very father of the Earl who had sacrificed the friendless man. Kenneth was visiting Paris on business in 1675, following King Charles II of England being restored to the throne. 
One day, so the story goes, his wife, the Lady Isabel, considered at the time to be one of the ugliest women in Scotland, had been left at Bran Castle and had become uneasy as he was away much longer than expected and had not sent any letters. Connick by then had become known as the Bran Seer and was known widely as a prophet. She called on him during a dance or gathering of local peers to use his powers which were famous far and wide. According to legend, he had gained these when his mother in a graveyard one night had seen a ghost of a Danish princess. She had stopped its return to the grave unless the ghost granted her son the second sight. The next day, a small white stone was found, and by looking into this adder stone, the future could be seen by him. It was this stone that the Lady Isabel requested for him to see through what her husband was doing in Paris at the time. The seer peered, laughed, and said, Fear not, for your lord, he is safe and sound, well and hearty, merry and happy. But Isabel wanted to know more. The seer then said, Be satisfied, ask no questions. Let it suffice you to know that your lord is well and merry. But for Isabel too, that was still not enough. She wanted to know everything. So the seer told her, Your lord is in a magnificent room, in a very fine company, and far too agreeably employed at present to think of leaving Paris. Yet the Lady Isabel still did not believe him fully and tried to learn more by bribes and requests, thinking he was hiding something. As you will know, that which will make you unhappy, I must tell you the truth. My lord seems to have little thought of you or of his children or of his highland home. I saw him in a gay gilded room, grandly decked out in velvets and silks and cloth of gold, and on his knees before him, a fair lady, his arm round her waist and her hand pressed to his lips. Isabel is said to have become enraged and embarrassed, having the prediction made in front of her peers, who were also in the room. She was then said to have condemned him, stating, You have spoken evil of dignities. You have vilified the mighty of the land. You have defamed a mighty chief in the midst of his vassals. You have abused my hospitality and outraged my feelings. You have sullied the good name of my lord in the halls of his ancestors, and you shall suffer the most signal vengeance I can inflict. You shall suffer the death. The seer was immediately taken away to be executed and drew out his white seeing stone saying, I see into the far future and I read the doom of the race of my oppressor. The long descended line of Seaforth will, ere many generations have passed, end in extinction and sorrow. I see a chief, the last of his house, both deaf and dumb. He will be the father of four fair sons, all of whom he will follow to the tomb. He will live careworn and die mourning, knowing that the honors of his line are to be extinguished forever, and no future chief of the Mackenzies shall bear rule at Brahan or in Kintail. After lamenting over the last and most promising of his sons, he himself shall sink into the grave, and the remnant of his possessions shall be inherited by a white-hooded lassie from the east, and she is to kill her sister. When he looks around him and sees them, he may know that his sons are doomed to death, that his broad land shall pass away to the stranger, and that his race shall come to an end. A number of versions of his death still exist, all similar. Most say he was tied hand and foot and carried to the local chanonry. Some say the seer threw his stone into nearby Loch Ussie as he was being carried to his execution site, saying whoever found it would gain his sight. He was condemned to be burned alive at the chanonry in a barrel of tar lined with metal spikes that had been driven into it. Immediately before this, Lady Isabel was said to have told him he would not go to heaven due to his witchcraft, and he predicted that upon his death a dove and raven would land upon his ashes. If the dove landed there first, he would go to heaven, but she would not. If the raven, then he would be denied entry and go to hell. As his ashes smoldered, a dove was seen to land on them, followed by a raven. Some versions of the tale say the Earl returned to Scotland that day, and learning of the execution rushed with his horse only to arrive minutes after the seer's death. A plaque still sits there today, near the site where he was burned for witchcraft. After his death, like Nostradamus, he is claimed to have predicted many events such as the Battle of Culloden, the Highland Clearances, and the Caledonian Canal. These can all be found in the book The Prophecies of the Brahan Seer, including the following prediction of the fall of the Mackenzies of Kilcoy, the castle, and the later curse of the dying man upon the lords of the house. When the girls of Kilcoy house cry out, the shell of our murderers is flowing over. A fox from Croy will come, who shall be like a wolf among the people, during forty years and more, and in his coat shall be many curses. He shall then be thrown empty and sorrowful, like an old besom behind the door, 
The large farmers will be like sportful birds, and the lairds as poor as the sparrows. There's a blessing in handsome honesty, and curses in the shedding of blood. When the stern castle of Kilcoy shall stand cold and empty, and the jackdaws and the rooks are artfully flying past it. While we do not have many other references to the Brahan seer in historic records during his lifetime, there is another court record a century before this. In 1577, a woman named Catherine Ross married Robert Moore Monroe. Catherine had children from a previous marriage and wanted these sons to inherit instead of Robert's. She recruited 26 witches who failed to kill them, but was then given a poison by a conic ower who was listed in the records as a local mystic. In 1577, a warrant was issued after the sons' deaths, and 26 women and 6 men were tried for diabolical practices of magic, enchantment, murder, homicide, and other offenses in 1578. A number of these were burned as witches at Channonry Point, also the exact site of the Brahan Sears, supposed death a century later. It is quite possible that the two Sears were mixed together by history to form the one Brahan Seer. As for the curse upon the family of the castle and Kilcoy Castle, it was to play out over centuries. The Earl of Seaforth returned from France dying in 1678 and was succeeded by the fourth Earl, also a Kenneth. He was made a Marquess for his support of deposed Stuart dynasty King James II and later died in 1701. The fifth Earl, William, supported the Jacobite cause and James II's son in the rebellion of 1715 and lost his lands and titles, dying in 1740. His son, yet another Kenneth, fought in 1745 on the side of the Jacobites and Bonnie Prince Charlie. He died in 1761. In 1771, his son Kenneth was made Earl of Seaforth, but this new title too died with him in 1781, as he had no heirs. His cousin, Thomas, inherited the lands and became a colonel. In 1783, the ship he was on was attacked by Indian pirates and he died of his wounds. In time, his brother Francis Mackenzie, Baron Seaforth, inherited and seemingly fulfilled the prophecy of the Brahan seer, for he was to become both deaf and mostly unable to speak after being struck with scarlet fever at the age of 12. Despite the initial setbacks, Francis was able to communicate via writing and was to go on to become a member of parliament, the governor of Barbados where he reformed slave laws and was also made a general. He contributed to botany, various societies, and also commissioned a famous painting. He was written of by Sir Walter Scott glowingly. The last Baron of Kintail, Francis, Lord Seaforth, was a nobleman of extraordinary talents, who must have made for himself a lasting reputation had not his political exertions been checked by painful natural infirmities. Francis married and had four sons who died before him, one after the other as he lived at the family seat of Brahan Castle. His sons William and George both died young, followed by Francis in 1813, and then finally the older William in 1814. Locals would increasingly speak of the family curse of the seer as each in turn died, and then Francis himself in 1815. He had sold much of the family lands in his last days, like the Isle of Lewis and the Channonry. His daughter Mary inherited Brahan Castle, which was most of what was then left. She had married an admiral, who she accompanied far to the east in India for many years. When he died in 1814, she came back from the east and was by then named Lady Hood after her late husband. Mary remarried to the Earl of Galloway, and one day, while driving her young sister Caroline Mackenzie in a carriage near Brahan Castle, the ponies took off, and Caroline was thrown from the carriage and fatally injured. Some blame was laid upon Mary for the accident. A plaque to Mary's sister Caroline's accident and death marks that site still today at Brahan. With this, the final words of the Brahan seer appeared to come to pass. I see a chief, the last of his house, both deaf and dumb. He will be the father of four fair sons, all of whom he will follow to the tomb. The remnant of his possessions shall be inherited by a white-hooded lassie from the east, and she is to kill her sister. The fall of the Mackenzie family houses too was to pass. Mary's last descendant, James, at Brahan Castle died in 1923, and after use by the military, the house was demolished in the 1950s. Around the same year that the Kintail Lord's castle we explored today was to become abandoned by the family. As for the later curse of the dying sacrifice man upon the castle and the Lord of Kilcoy's castle, this too was to come to pass. 
Kilcoy was to become a ruin in the 1700s as the family's wealth declined, with the last baronet, Sir Evan Mackenzie, dying in 1883 with no heirs, his own line becoming extinct. It was later restored in 1891 and is now under new ownership having passed from the family. Sir Walter Scott was to write of the family's fall in the lament for the last of the Seaforths. In vain the bright course of thy talents to wrong, fate deadened thy ear and imprisoned thy tongue. For brighter o'er all her obstructions arose the glow of the genius they could not oppose, and who in the land of the Saxon or Gael might match with Mackenzie, high chief of Kintail? Thy sons rose around thee and lighten and love, all a father could hope, all a friend could approve. What avails if the tale of thy sorrows to tell, in the springtime of youth and of promise they fell? Of the lion of Mackenneth remains not a male, to bear the proud name of the chief of Kintail. And thou, gentle dame, who must bear to thy grief, for thy clan and thy country the cares of a chief, who brief rolling moons and six changes have left, of thy husband and father and brethren bereft. To thine ear of affection how sad is the hail that salutes thee, the heir of the Lion of Kintail. We leave the castle as we found it, looming through the trees, a dark connection to its lasting curse. Forgotten and alone, it stands cold and empty, with the jackdaws and the rooks today still artfully flying past it. Join us next time as we search for a lost mansion and unexpectedly discover a mysterious tower. Thank you for watching. For more unique abandoned places and their lost stories, follow us today by subscribing and hitting the bell icon. Until next time.